All right, today is the uh, second installment uh, on the series we're kind of doing on the kingdom of God. And just to kind of remind you what we talked about last week, you know, it was titled last week, The Already But, the, but Not Yet, kind of way the, theologians kind of speak about it. Um, the kingdom of God simply means the rule and reign of God in whatever area, whatever sphere that is. It's not salvation. Salvation, again, is the entry point into the kingdom, but it's not the kingdom, and it's the major vehicle that the Lord uses to spread the kingdom. And it's not the church. Again, it, it's church is part of the kingdom, and it's not the United States of America. The kingdom of God affects every area of life. So education, uh, economy, business, anything you can think of, culture, uh, entertainment, all, every area of life should have the kingdom of God being manifested in it, all those areas. It was also the primary m- message of Jesus. Last time we went over like probably 25 different verses talking about where Jesus spoke about the kingdom of God is near. Repent, for the kingdom of God is here. And that was his primary message, primary message of John the Baptist, primary message of the apostles that they went out. And I gave the kind of the analogy of how uh, the presence of the future is kind of like in World War II again, during uh, the Normandy invasion, when our troops landed on the beach and secured the beach, that pretty well set in mind what was going to happen as far as who's going to win the war. We were going to win the war. But in the midst of that, there were more casualties after Normandy than there was before. So in other words, we have that picture of, yes, the kingdom of God is here, and yet there's a lot of warfare that's going to be going on between now and the future. So the kingdom of God is here today, but its fullness will not be seen until Christ returns. And so we're living in this kind of funky area in a way where the kingdom of God is here, and yet we're not going to see the future until he comes back again. So today, I want to kind of give a little history of the kingdom of God And I'm calling this one The Presence of the Future, or a subtitle could be One and Done, because that's what the disciples thought. It was one, and it was done, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But the the term Kingdom of God, or Kingdom of Heaven, is not found anywhere in in the Old Testament. Now, the concept is definitely there, and so what the Old Testament gives us is it gives us a pretty good picture of of when this was going to happen. And so I want us to look at Daniel. So if you open your Bibles or your mobile device, whatever you're using, to the prophet Daniel, Daniel chapter 2. And we're going to look, we're going to actually start reading in verse 26, but I'm going to go back before we do that, because you really need to understand the whole thing that's happening here in, uh, in chapter 2 before that. So, so what has happened is King Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, okay, he, he's king over the, the known earth at the time. I mean, when he's talking about king, he's the absolute authority. He's like the dictator. No one can counter him. Whatever he decides happens. There's no argument. It's just the way that is. So he had a dream. So he has a dream one night, and it's a very vivid dream, and it's a very uh, troubling dream to him. So he's very disturbed by this dream. So he calls all his uh, wise men, his uh, magicians, the Chaldeans to come because he wants to know what this dream means. But there's a big catch with it. So he tells him he wants to interpret the dream, but he says, but first you've got to tell me what the dream is. And they're going, what? 
No king, no one's ever asked people to interpret a dream to tell you what the dream is. And so that's right. Uh, you have to tell me what the dream was, and then you interpret the dream. And so they were, again, saying, well, it's impossible. No one can do that. And that just made Nebuchadnezzar more upset. And he said, if you guys don't do it, if you guys don't tell me what my dream is, and if you don't tell me what the interpretation is, I'm going to kill you guys. I'm going to destroy your houses and your family. So talk about pressure. Who would like to volunteer to do that, huh? To tell the guy, to tell the king what his dream was and then to interpret it. So we're going to pick the story up in verse 26 of Daniel chapter 2. And it says, the king asked Daniel, who is also called Bethsheshar, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Now Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the vision that passed through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Now, I want to stop for a second because Daniel was considered one of the wise men, okay? So his life was threatened along with the three Hebrew ch children, his friends. And so he had asked his friends to pray, pray for God to give him the dream and the interpretation. So in verse 29, it says, As you were li lying there, O king, your mind turned to things to come, and the revealer of mysteries showed you what is going to happen. As for me, this mystery has been revealed, not because I have greater wisdom than other living men, but so that you, O king, may know the interpretation, and that you may understand what went through your mind. You looked, O king, and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. Now, while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron and clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now this was a dream, and now we were interpreted to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands... He has placed mankind and the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air. Wherever they live, he has made you ruler over them. You are the head of gold. Now after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be fourth, a fourth kingdom... Strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Now, just as you saw that the feet and the toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be the divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it. Even as you saw the iron mixed with clay, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so 
So this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and the interpretation is trustworthy. So Daniel gives him his dream, the very dream that the king had dreamed, and then he gives him the interpretation. Now I think about all scholars agree uh, on these, these four kingdoms. So the first one is the head of gold, of course, was the Babylonian Empire with Nebuchadnezzar as a head. And that went from about 625 B.C. to 539 B.C. Now the chest and arms of silver was a Medo-Persian Empire, and it went from 539 to 331 B.C. The middle and thighs of bronze was a Greek empire started by Alexander the Great, which conquered the known world at the time, even though he died a very young age, and then his kingdom was divided among four generals. But it was from 331 to 61 B.C. Now the last kingdom, the legs of iron, feet of iron, and clay, was a Roman empire. Now it went from 62 B.C. to 476 A.D. So it shows when this was going to happen, when this rock, this kingdom that would never be destroyed, would come about. But at the same time, the Roman Empire, that was 539 years. So they had a pretty big span of time. So you knew it was coming. The average Jewish person know that, that Jesus was going to come. Well, not Jesus, but the Messiah would come during the time of the Roman Empire. But that's 539 years, so that's a long span of time. So they were expecting it to come. But what I want you to look at is, look back at verse 44, and I want you to have your understanding. If you were reading this scripture, and you don't have the New Testament, you know nothing about the New Testament, because hindsight's 2020. Now we look at this from our viewpoint. But what I'm telling you is that if you were alive at that time, you also would not uh, have understood. You would be like the disciples. You would be like John the Baptist, the average Jew of, of the temple, second temple period, which was that it is a one and done. In other words, Messiah is coming. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to rule forever, kick off the Roman Empire. It's over. They didn't have a concept of two comings. Of a long period of time, we've already 2,000 years of living in this, in this period of time. So look at verse 44. It says, In the time of these kings, meaning the last kingdom, the Roman Empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. Okay, you're reading this for the first time. You're not reading it in light of the New Testament. Nor will be left to another people. It will crush all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. So as you're reading that, I think we have to be honest and say, yeah, I'm thinking the same thing they are. It's one and done. The Messiah's coming. He's setting up his kingdom. It's going to be the end of the story forever because there's no end to his kingdom. So that was, that was their mindset. It was really, and I should have maybe... Uh, Subtitle, this one and done. But I want to look at a couple more examples. So if you go back to Isaiah chapter 9, just to show you again, get the context of, of, of how they were thinking, what their viewpoint was. 
in Isaiah chapter 9. In fact, let's go back to 6 of chapter 9. Because it's a prophetic passage about the Messiah who's going to be coming. It says, for us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from the time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So as you're reading that, there will be no end of the increase of his government. So again, their viewpoint, their thinking was, as the Messiah comes, he's setting up the kingdom. It's a one and done deal. Another example in Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 40. There's a flip over there. And this is uh, specifically uh, talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. But in verse 3, chapter 40, it says, A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley, valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, and the rugged place a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all mankind together will see it. For the Lord, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So John the Baptist knew this, this scripture, and we're going to look at another one in just a second. But again, from their viewpoint, and that would be our viewpoint, if we didn't have the New Testament and didn't, and didn't have the hindsight that we have, we would be thinking that when the Messiah comes, he's setting up his kingdom, it is done. So the last one I want to look at is Malachi chapter 1. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, right before Matthew. And this is uh, specifically talking about John the Baptist. In fact, Jesus uh, will qu quote this about him. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. He says, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And by the way, we are all called to that, mi that ministry of preparing the way of the Lord. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come into his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. So suddenly he will come. They were preparing the way. They were expecting the Messiah to come. They had a mindset of what this was going to look like. But when reality comes, it's a little different story. So since we're talking about John the Baptist, let's turn to Matthew chapter 11. Next book over. Matthew 11, and we're going to start in verse 2. It says, when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Now, why would John be asking that? He knew he was there at the baptism of Jesus. He saw him baptized. He saw the Holy Spirit, the form of a dove, come down. He knew that he was the Messiah. But now, all of a sudden, it's kind of like, well, for one thing, he's sitting in prison. He's about to lose his head. Herod's going to be cutting his head off. The kingdom doesn't look like we're kicking off the Romans and doesn't look like we're setting up the kingdom. It's like, what's up? What's, what's going on? This, this is not what I was expecting, which also ought to give us a little clue, too, on our expectation of what the second coming might look like. 
Don't get your two hold on too tight to, uh, to your theology. But Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind will see sight, the lame walk, and those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Some versions say, blessed are those who are not offended at me. In other words, not offended at how this thing is playing out. Because this was not, the, this was not what you were thinking. And Jesus knows this. I mean, they're, they're ingrained with a certain picture of how this is going to happen. And it's not happening. So as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in the king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one whom it was written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before, the, before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the day of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. Many versions will say violent men. For all the prophets and all the law prophesied until John. And if you were willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. He who has an ear, let him hear. So again, we have John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, knew that Jesus was Messiah, and yet he's in this place now of doubting, going, what's going on? This It's not happening like I thought it would. Because we thought that Messiah was coming, kicking out the Romans, setting up a kingdom, and this is forevermore. The increases of government shall never decrease. So how does this work? So blessed is the man who does not fall away or offended on account of me. Now, another example would be Peter. So, if you turn over to Matthew 16, a couple chapters over. Then we're going to start in verse 21. It says, "From, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to the disciples. Okay? I'm going to explain something to you guys that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. And Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So, Peter, when Jesus is plainly telling him, hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to be turned over, tried. I'm going to be killed, raised on the third day. And they're going, no way. I mean, that's not how it's supposed to plan. That's not the plan. That's not how this thing is supposed to work. You're setting up the kingdom. And then Jesus has to rebuke Peter. So it took a while for them to get this message. And it was over and over again that he kept telling them, I'm, you know, I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be turned over. This is not going to play out like you think it's going to play out. So, for Peter, 
and all the disciples, their understanding of the kingdom of heaven was wrong. They did not, they did not understand the already, but not yet, or the presence of the future. Because think of it in your mind or their mind at the time, how can the kingdom of God be both future and present at the same time? They just, it was hard for them to grasp that full concept. I want you to turn over to Luke chapter 4. This is an interesting passage where Jesus is coming into uh, his hometown of Nazareth. And we're going to look at verses 16 through 21. And this, we'll just go back to 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout over the whole country. He taught into the synagogue, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Now the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So that's a in very important scripture, it's one that I think that we can kind of take on ourselves because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. He's anointed us to preach good news, heal the sick, set captives free. But what's interesting, verse 19, he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So what he does, he's, he's, uh, he's quoting Isaiah 61, but he stops in the middle of, of the verse. Why does he do that? Well, let's go back to Isaiah chapter 61. Because we're going to finish reading what that text says. Chapter 61 will be uh, verse 1. So he's quoting this from Isaiah. It says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captive, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But there he stopped. The rest of that verse says, and the day of vengeance of our God. So it was not time for the vengeance of our God, for the, com for the coming, second coming of Christ, because the second coming, the kingdom of God, consummation is both salvation and its judgment. So he stopped before the judgment. And it's like the day of the Lord, although there's several days of the Lord throughout Scripture, I'll use the one capital D, day of the Lord, meaning the last when the Lord returns. The day of the Lord, it says, is both great and terrible. It's great for us who are in Christ. It's going to be terrible for those who aren't. So his mission in the first coming was not to bring the day of vengeance of our God. That was yet to be future. So that's why he stopped really in the middle of a verse or a passage. Now, I want to finish with Galatians chapter 4. We turn over to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to look at verses 4 through 7. Let's go back and just start at 1. Chapter 4, verse 1. Because he's talking, Paul is talking to the Galatians about um, the law, the Torah, 
uh, the Judaizers who are trying to get them to follow that. And he says, for I am saying that as long as the heir is a child, and he is no different from a slave, although he owns a whole, the whole estate, he is subject to a guardian and trustee until the time set by the father. So also, we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, did you realize you didn't get a vote on that? You know, when the time, God the Father is the one who said, now, at that time in history is when he sent his son. The same way, you don't get a vote on the second coming. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Since you are no longer a slave, but a son, and since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So once you think about that, we have been made heirs. We are sons and daughters. Sometimes, you know, women say, how come about the son of God? What about the women? Well, just like we, uh, men are also the bride of Christ. So we don't want to trip up over that. But sons and daughters of the Most High, we are heirs of what? We are heirs of the kingdom of God. We have been brought into this place, which has tremendous benefits, which has uh, so much for us that we begin to live as the king's kids, to realize, hey, I'm, a, I'm actually a child of God, yes, but I'm also a son of God. That God has brought me into this place, delivered me from a kingdom of darkness, and placed me in the kingdom of light. He has done so much through this. And so we find our pla- ourselves living in this place where the kingdom is present, but it's not yet completely fulfilled. And it won't be completely fulfilled until the Lord turns. But our job is to expand the kingdom of God, to grow the kingdom of God, to see it expand and grow. You know, he said first in Jerusalem, you know, if you, if you picture t- taking a rock and throw it into a pond and watching the ripples go out, it's kind of like that. First in Jerusalem, then in Samaria, then into the uttermost parts of the earth. So we have a position, and we've been given a lot, and we'll probably be talking about that in future weeks. Everything has been given us. Everything that we need for godliness has been given to us. Everything we need to, to expand, but we need to change our thinking and realize that we are heirs of a kingdom. And it's a kingdom that's never going to, it's never going to, it's never going to be replaced. It's going to be forever. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be awesome. And we are those children. We've been given so much, so much has been done for us. And so we need to begin to, to realize, and, and again, not to be too hard on, on the disciples or the first century Jews, because we would have been the same way. And you can say, well, Isaiah 53, yeah, but most people wouldn't see that. That's hindsight looking at it. We would have been the same way. We're expecting our Messiah to come, to set up that kingdom, It's a one-and-done deal. Instead, we find our place over 2,000 years spreading the kingdom, having it grow. And it says, until what? Until all his enemies are placed under his feet. And that's part of our job. And part of our job is Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us to preach good news. And that the kingdom of God is good news. But there comes a day when the kingdom of God is both great and it's also terrible. The the day of the Lord comes and you're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. And judgment will come on that day. So I want to kind of encourage you guys as we begin to go forward on this. Think about all that's been done on our behalf. How we have the New Testament, which obviously they didn't have. 
And so we understand, we see a lot more than they did. But there's much more that's coming our way. And the, whole, the, the times are going to get more and more intense. Dark is going to get darker. Light is going to get lighter. So you have this, this the culmination of, of things coming to a head. And so we need to be strong in our faith. We need to be spending time with the Lord, realizing this life, you know, the word says that we are, we are sojourners. In other words, we're just passing through this life. This world is temporary. The, the kingdom of God is eternal. And we are citizens of that kingdom. So I want to encourage you this morning, begin to stir yourself up, realizing that you are an heir, heir of God. What a privilege. And as we go forward again in the weeks to come, we'll be talking about all the things that have been given us and how we can expand his kingdom. And again, it's not just so often we think of, you know, religious, you know, activities or we think about the church, but the kingdom of God is in every sphere. It, it needs to be pushed into it that the darkness displaced or let the light displace the darkness, whether that's in, you know, in music, entertainment, whatever, you know, that we're pushing the kingdom of God and light over darkness. All right, so Lord, we just thank you. Lord, that you have done so much for us. Lord, that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. That you have brought us out from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. That your kingdom will never end. It goes from glory to glory to glory. And Lord, that you have chosen us. You have given us life. You have called us heirs. You have called us sons and daughters. And Lord, we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that Lord, when we tried to do it our way, it didn't work out too well. So Lord, we want to do things your way. We trust in you, Lord. So I ask today, Lord, that this whole concept of the kingdom of God, the whole concept that we are heirs of a kingdom and we are representatives of, of the king, Lord, that you would help us, Lord, draw us closer and closer to you, Lord. And we just ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.